Hello students, thank you for watching this video. This is Professor Ryan Paul, and this is a video on close reading The Werewolf by Angela Carter. So we'll talk about close reading as a literary skill and then apply that to this particular short story. I just wanted to preface this video by saying this is actually an older video lecture that I've done. Um, so the slides and the sound on the next few slides, there's a lot of narration over a very few slides. So it might be a little bit slower than uh, many, of the other many of the other videos, just in terms of how the visuals progress. So as a tip, just feel free to take notes. You don't have to actually watch the screen during the entire video because, again, there'll be a, a very few changes over the course of the lecture itself. So feel free to take notes, look away, do some reading and writing while you're watching and listening to this video. So what is close reading? Well, the name kind of gives it away. Um, it's a form of reading, right? So we know what reading is, but it's close. So, you know, imagine a sort of physical closeness. Imagine that you're putting your eyes right there up close to the paper. Um, what does that imply? What sort of attitude does that imply? Well, it means that you are focusing on detail focusing on the specifics. So it's about paying close attention to the text. Now again, as I said, close reading is the foundational technique of modern literary study. It's what all literary critics, no matter what their particular school of thought or what their training or what type of literature they study, it's pretty much foundational to just about everything that literary critics do. And again, this is one of the most powerful tools and one of the most important tools that you can learn in a literary and in a literature class because close reading is something that you can apply to every text, any and every text. Close read a speech by a politician and you will learn a lot about what's really going on in that politician's mind and what they're thinking and the way they're trying to appeal to their uh, uh, supporters. So close reading is very important. Again, the emphasis here is on detail and the particular rather than the general. So this is also why I'm having you do your analysis papers where you'll be doing usually a close reading after you've done your response papers. The response paper is where you sort of think in general about the story. The close reading or the analysis is where you focus more specifically on a small section of the text and really dig into it. So emphasis on detail, particularities, specifics. When you're close reading, what are you doing? You're paying very close attention, again, to the individual words the phrases in the text, the syntax, that is the way the sentence is structured, what's the grammatical format, and every other aspect, any other aspect of language use in a text. So it's really how are the words on the page being used and how does the way the, the sentence, the line, the phrase, how is the way it's written important uh, to creating meaning and looking at those specifics and it gets this specific as saying well if you put one word in front of the other it's a different meaning than if you switch the order of those words so it's very detail oriented and the purpose of close reading is to we often use the metaphor of unfolding or unpacking the text and think about what that means when you unpack your suitcase what are you doing well you've got all this stuff in the suitcase right? It's all compressed in there. You open the suitcase, you unpack it, and now you've got all those individual items that were compressed into one small space. Now you can see them all individually and distinctly. Similarly, if you're unfolding something, you have a piece of paper that's been folded up. It's compressed. All the different sides and, and, and facets and, and uh, sides of it are pressed together but then you unfold it so we can see more of it at the same time so the purpose of close reading is not to decode or translate right you're not trying to find a one-to-one -one meaning that x word represents y other word or or idea 
but you're looking for multiple meanings. You're looking for implications. You're looking for uh, complexity. So, and another way to put this is that close reading is the first aspect of or the foundational part of reading between the lines. That is, what's being said without being said? What is this author trying to communicate without saying it explicitly? And so again, thinking about this, if you can close read a short story or a poem or a play, then how much better can you understand the unspoken messages when you're talking to your significant other or the unspoken messages when you're talking to your boss or your parents or the unspoken messages, again, that are coming through from a political speech. So that's why close reading is really, really important because it gives you that ability to read between the lines and see that, as I said in our very first uh, uh, introduction video, things are more complex than they appear at first. So now let's jump into it directly. And what I've put here is the first couple paragraphs of The Werewolf by Angela Carter. And this is what I'm going to close read. And this is what I have close read in the sample analysis paper on the Blackboard site. And one of the things that you'll do in your own um, analyses, the first thing that you'll do is type out the passage that you're selecting in the paper so we know what, what it is that you're looking at. So I will briefly read this out for us. The werewolf is a northern country. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. Cold, tempest, wild beasts in the forest. It is a hard life. Their houses are built of logs, dark and smoky within. There will be a crude icon of the virgin behind a guttering candle. The leg of a pig hung up to cure. A string of drying mushrooms. A bed, a stool, a table. Harsh, brief, poor lives. To these upland woodsmen, the devil is as real as you or I. More so. They have not seen us, nor even know that we exist. But the devil they glimpse often in the graveyards those bleak and touching townships of the dead where the graves are marked with portraits of the deceased in the naif style and there are no flowers to put in front of them. No flowers grow there. So they put out small votive offerings, little loaves, sometimes a cake that the bears come lumbering from the margins of the forest to snatch away. At midnight, especially on Walpurgisnacht, the devil holds picnics in the graveyards and invites the witches. Then they dig up fresh corpses and eat them. Anyone will tell you that. So what do you do? How do you engage in a close reading? Well, you want to proceed through the text very carefully and very slowly, sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, or even word by word if necessary. So this is a painstaking process, which is why it's very hard to close read a large section and why I'm only asking you to close read a small portion of each text when you do your analysis papers. So let's start. And, and as you'll see, what I've mainly done here is I've offered a number of questions for each of the little segments that I am going to analyze. And I'll talk a little bit about possible answers to these. And again, in the sample analysis paper on the blog, uh, you'll be able to see how someone might answer these. But the purpose here, I want to provide you with these questions to spur your own thoughts on the subject. So let's begin with the title, which I didn't actually do in the sample paper. But let's begin with the title here because I think it is important. The werewolf. What is a werewolf? What, what makes a werewolf? What ideas or images does this bring to mind? And what expectations does this create for you for the rest of the story when you see that the title is The Werewolf? So I'll give you a moment to think about that. Take a second to think about that. Even pause the recording if you like to, to make a couple notes. But so thinking about a werewolf, well, a werewolf is a human that turns into a wolf, right? Turns into a monster um, during the full moon usually, right? 
and it's because of a curse or because it's been bitten by another werewolf, right? But it's a supernatural monster. And so just by titling the story The Werewolf, at least for me, the expectations that I might have is, okay, this is a horror story. Although it's a sort of classic horror story. We don't usually tell stories about werewolves these days. They're not the most popular monsters anymore. But it seems like, okay, I'm going to expect a horror story about a monster. But also, to get a little further, to get a little deeper into this, thinking about the werewolf symbolically, right? that a werewolf joins together a human and an animal. It's both and, or maybe it's neither or. A werewolf is not human, not wolf, but both human and wolf. And we usually like to think about humans and animals as being different, right? Humans are a different category from animals, but the werewolf brings those two categories together. Keep that in mind, one, as you're reading this story, and certainly as you read The Company of Wolves. The first lines of this story, it is a northern country. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. So the questions I've asked, and I'll ask these, these same questions a number of times throughout this close reading. What does this tell us about the setting and about the characters? And what is the connection between them? So take a moment to think about that. Now, in terms of setting, it gives us some very specific, well, not quite that specific, but it gives us some details, and they're literal details, right? That it's a northern country, that we're in the north. And as we see, what that means is that we're in a, a land that's cold. It's cold weather in this north. So that might already set our expectations. Well, if we think about cold, what kinds of stories are told in cold northern settings? Or what kind of mood or atmosphere might be created by a place with cold weather? Well, it might be a little gloomy, for example. Now, that last part, they have cold hearts. And notice the parallel structure. They have cold weather. They have cold hearts. The two statements are almost identical. The only difference is in that last word, weather versus hearts. Now, while they have cold weather is a literal statement, the weather is literally cold, we don't mean that their hearts are literally cold. That is, it's not that, that if we were to take a thermometer and measure their hearts, it would be, you know, negative five Fahrenheit or something like that. So when we say they have cold hearts, we mean that metaphorically or figuratively. And what does that mean to say that someone is cold or has a cold heart? Well, it means they're cruel or uncaring. They don't have, again to speak figuratively, warmth. They don't have that humanity that makes them approachable or likable. So that last question, what's the connection between the setting and the characters? There's an implied, almost causal connection. That is, because they've grown up in a land that is cold, they themselves have become cold. Think about the way in which setting, where you live, where you grow up, what you experience around you, how that affects who you are. Moving on. The next sentence, cold, tempest, wild beasts in the forest. Now looking at this, what do you notice about the structure of the sentence? And what is, what repetition do you see here? And that's thinking about going back to those first sentences. What is repeated? So first off, this isn't actually, technically speaking, even a real sentence. Grammatically speaking, this is not a proper sentence. There's no verb. Nothing happens. It's just a list of things. Cold, tempest, wild beasts. It's like a grocery list. So it's not really a sentence. It's almost like, again, a sort of impression. Just showing us little glimpses of things in this world. What are the aspects of it? Well, it's cold. Tempest, meaning storms. And wild beasts in the forest. 
Now, in terms of repetition, the most obvious thing that's repeated is that idea of cold. So the, the narrator here is really emphasizing cold. That's important to this story for some reason. The coldness of this land and presumably then the coldness of the people. Now, another question which I haven't asked here, I haven't typed out here is, what are these things? Why are, why are we being told these things? Well, these are all, in some ways, rather unpleasant things, things that make this life difficult. The fact that it is cold, the fact that it is stormy, and perhaps most ominously, that there are wild beasts in the forest. And what, does, what do wild beasts in the forest mean? They mean danger. So even though it's not a real sentence, it actually communicates quite a bit. Moving on. It is a hard life. Their houses are built of logs, dark and smoky within. So again, what does this tell us about the setting? What does it tell us about the characters? And again, what expectations does this create for us for the rest of the story? Well, it tells us what these characters' lives are like, that it's hard. And that reinforces, in some sense, what's already been told, that this is a cold place, that these are cold people, and that they are surrounded by dangers. And it also tells us a little bit about their lifestyle. right? This, these are not people who live in fancy houses or mansions. These are people whose lives are very simple. They've got wooden houses, and they're not very comfortable. They're dark, so they you know, probably don't have electricity. And they're smoky within, right? It's unpleasant. They, they have fires in their house, uh, in their fireplace, or in their chimney, um, or, or uh, oven, or whatever. But it gets smoky. It's unpleasant, right? This is not a technologically advanced society. And so in terms of expectations, this continues, I think, to reinforce and to set that expectation that well, the story that we're being told here is about a, a harsh place and harsh people and, and a certain amount of unpleasantness. There will be a crude icon of the Virgin behind a guttering candle. Now, first off, just notice that whereas in the last couple slides I was giving you complete sentences, here I'm giving you only part of a sentence. Again, as I said at the very beginning, sometimes in close reading, you, you need to go sentence by sentence, but sometimes you need to break it down into more smaller units. You might go phrase by phrase, or again, even word by word. So here I've picked out just part of a sentence, and I'm focusing on that. So what are the most important words? What words stand out to you in this image? Which words seem to be the ones that most effectively communicate and create a picture in your mind of what this world is like. It's probably not the words, there will be, or the, right? And what ideas are created or implied by this description? What images does it create in your mind? What does it make you think about? So first off, who is this virgin that is mentioned? Well, probably the Virgin Mary. And so if these people have images of the Virgin Mary in their homes, what does that tell us about them? Well, probably that they're religious and more specifically Catholic. But it's a crude icon. And if, there, if there'd be one word that I had to pick out of this sentence as being most important, it'd be crude, right? Because this is not a fancy painting of the Virgin Mary on the wall. This is not an elaborate piece of art. This is not a decoration. This is something primitive and probably not very realistic, something handmade. And so that tells us also, you know, why do they have it? Again, probably not for artistic reasons, probably for very serious religious reasons. And again, that idea that it's crude reinforces the harshness of this world and reinforces the, the sort of seriousness and difficulty of the lives that these people face and the relative, we might say, primitive nature of their world, right? They are not technologically advanced, as we've already said. 
moving on, and this is continuing part of the same sentence that we just uh, examined at the top of the, the slide. The leg of a pig hung up to cure, a string of drying mushrooms, a bed, a stool, a table, harsh, brief, poor lives. So what is important about these items listed? What do you again, again notice about the syntax or structure of the sentence? And again, once more, what does this tell us about the setting and characters? Now, there might be specific symbolic meanings behind the leg of a pig or drying mushrooms or even a bed, a stool, a table. Maybe these represent something else, but not necessarily. And I don't think we necessarily have to try to say, well, the bed represents a blank. But what does this tell us about them? Again, well, who hangs up legs of pigs to cure in their own house or drying mushrooms? These are not people who have refrigerators. These are not people who um, can go to the grocery store to buy food. They've hunted that pig, or not hunted the pig, they've raised that pig and slaughtered it, and they're curing it in their own house. They've grown those mushrooms or gone out and picked them themselves. So these are people who live, uh, again, as the quote says, a harsh life. These are people whose lives are simple. These are people whose lives are governed by, most likely, survival. The second two sentences in this excerpt, again, not really even proper sentences, just a list of things. Right? The first sentence, a bed, a stool, a table, just three items. And it's almost like we can imagine a camera panning around this room. What do we see? Well, we see the icon. We see the candle. We see the leg of the pig. We see the mushrooms. We see the bed. We see the stool. We see the table. Very simple things. The bed, stool, table are not described, so we probably can imagine them as being pretty simple and primitive, not comfortable pieces of furniture. And there's a sort of echo in that second sentence, harsh, brief, poor lives. Right? Three and three, bed, stool, table, harsh, brief, poor. There's a kind of almost poetry here in that rhythm. And so this reinforces once more the idea of the harshness of the setting, and it connects once more the characters to the things that are around them. Just like cold weather, cold hearts, well, their harsh, brief, poor lives are tied intimately to these very simple, very poor, very basic amenities that they have in their house. To these upland woodsmen, the devil is as real as you or I. So this is something where the narrator becomes quite present. What do you notice about the narrator here? And what's the relationship created between the narrator, the reader, that is us, and the characters in the story? Secondly, what's the effect of introducing the devil to the story, introducing the devil as a potential character in the story? What does the devil bring to mind? And again, how does that affect the way you think about and, and uh, what expectations you have for what's going to happen in this story. So first off, it's quite interesting, I think, that the narrator uses the first person here and call, says, I. Also, the narrator specifically addresses us as reader, you. And that's unusual. Both those things are, are somewhat unusual, uh, especially speaking directly to the reader. But what's most interesting, perhaps, is the way the narrator and the reader, you and I, are grouped on one side and then the characters on the other, right? There's this world where the upland woodsmen live, the people who live in this, this harsh land, and the devil is also there, and that's one world. And then there's us, the narrator and the reader, and we're in a different world. And there's almost a disconnect between us, right? Because they don't think that we are real. That's rather ironic given that we are real and they're not. They're the fictional characters. 
Now, the effect of introducing the devil. Well, the devil is obviously an ominous character. The devil is associated with evil, disobedience, death, hell, torture, sin, all these very negative things. And so the devil is a part of this world. And to these upland woodsmen, the devil is real. So what does that tell us about them, about their beliefs, about their values, about the way they view the world around them? Now, some people in modern society do believe in the reality of the devil, but many people don't. Certainly, more people don't believe in the devil than, than did 100 years ago. Uh, so if you don't believe in the devil, I don't believe in the devil. I don't imagine when I look at the world and I see something bad, I don't imagine that that's because the devil caused it. But to these upland woodsmen, what do they see when they look around the world? What do they see when they look around them and see, for example, a young child who falls sick and dies or uh, a bad harvest that causes the town to go hungry? Well, to them, that's the devil operating in the world. They have a very different understanding of the way things work than someone who lives in a modern, more scientifically oriented society might have. Moving on. More so, they have not seen us, nor even know that we exist, but the devil they glimpse often in the graveyards. So again, what does this tell us about the setting and characters? And what is that idea of the graveyard? What new images or ideas does that create? So the first part of the sentence is just saying that, you know, for the people in this story, the devil is actually more real than we are, right? Because they've never seen us. They have no reason to believe that we exist, but they have seen the devil. They see the devil often. And again, think about that. How often do you see the devil in the world? Even if you are a person who believes in the devil, and that's fine if you do. How often do you look around and actually physically see the devil? Probably not very often, but these people do see the devil. So it tells us something about this world. This is, and this could be expected from the title being the werewolf, this is a world where supernatural things happen. Now the graveyard, I think, continues that, that ominous tone that's been building throughout the story. Right. Where, what, what's in a graveyard? Well, dead bodies. Death. Graveyards are sad, somber places. Right. There's all sorts of superstitions. Even today, people have about graveyards. Right. People who don't don't want to breathe when they're driving past a graveyard. They hold their breath. People who don't want to go to a graveyard late at night. So. The graveyard is an ominous place, and it adds to that mood of fear and ominousness that's being created. Again here, I'm continuing on from a part of the sentence. This continues from the part of the sentence that, that uh, uh, we just talked about at the end of the last slide. Those bleak and touching townships of the dead. So this is a description of the graveyard, another way to describe the graveyard. They're calling it bleak and touching townships of the dead. Incidentally, this is a metaphor. So what ideas are sub suggested by this description of the graveyards? That is, why call it a bleak and touching township of the dead? Why define it in that way? We normally wouldn't think about a graveyard as a township, but what does using that word do? Well, as I say in the sample analysis, it creates a certain parallel between the village where the people, the living people are, and the graveyard where the dead people are. They're like two towns, an above ground town and an underground town, a town of the living, a town of the dead. There's a certain, you know, they're flip sides of the same coin. One is a place of life, one is a place of death, one is a place of light, maybe, one is a place of darkness. Now we can get into what bleak and touching mean. 
I think especially that word touching is interesting, but I'll leave that to you all to think about why are they touching? What does it mean to say it's a, a bleak and touching township of the dead? Continuing on in the same sentence, uh, so these are bleak and touching townships of the dead where the graves are marked with portraits of the deceased in the knife style and there are no flowers to put in front of them, no flowers grow there. I'll leave it to you to uh, look up the word naif and see what that means so you can understand um, what they're saying about the style of the portraits that are being placed on the graves. Hint, it's similar to the idea of the crude icon. But what does this tell us about the characters and their values? And again, what details do we learn about the setting and what ideas or implications are created by those details? So first, thinking about the characters and their values. Well, these are people who go to the graveyard and they put portraits of their lost relatives and friends. They mark the graves with the portraits of those that they've lost. So they have a connection to the dead, right? They value these dead. They're important to them. These aren't graveyards that they just leave them and let them overgrow with weeds and so forth, but they, they try to take care of it. They, the dead are important to them. And as I talk about a little bit in the analysis paper, um, or maybe it was the response paper, um, I talk a little bit about, you know, the idea of, well, this might remind you of uh, in certain cultures where there's, all, there's uh, practices of ancestor worship, right? And people give offerings uh, to their um, uh, uh, to the dead. And that's something that's popular in many Asian cultures, um, in uh, very uh, many Latin American cultures, right? There are practices of leaving food and so forth to honor those that have been lost recently. So this tells us something very important about the characters and their values. It echoes perhaps that image of the crude, uh, the crude icon of the Virgin, right? These are people with certain religious values. And the detail we learn about the setting is that there are no flowers there because the flowers can't grow. Of course, that's probably not surprising given how harsh the weather is. But symbolically, what does it mean to say no flowers grow there? What are flowers associated with? What ideas come to mind when you think about flowers? Love, beauty, life, blooming, springtime all things that are absent from this land because cold weather, harsh lives, right? So the setting here is a place where life struggles, where there's no beauty, where death is always right around the corner. So again, emphasizing, creating that ominousness, that bleakness, that harshness of the world. Because no flowers grow there, so they put out small votive offerings, little loaves, sometimes a cake. Again, what does this tell us about the characters and their values? Well, just to reiterate what I said in the, on the last slide, these are people who care about their dead. The dead are important to them. They give them offerings, right? They give them food. They care about their dead. But what happens to those little loaves, those cakes? Well, the bears come lumbering from the margins of the forest to snatch away. So, again, what does this tell us about life in this world? And how does this repeat or reinforce earlier ideas in the story? Well, that it's a dangerous place. Remember those wild beasts in the forest? Sometimes they don't stay in the forest. Sometimes they come out of the forest and into the human realm. They come into our world, or rather, the village, the village people's world. So it's a dangerous place, and it's a place where not only is the devil and death right around the corner, so these supernatural things, but there are natural dangers. Just like the weather, there are wild animals, bears that come and can snatch away things at any point in time. 
Now look at this image of the margins of the forest and think about what's going on here. The bear is in the forest where it belongs, right? In the wilderness. It leaves the forest, crosses over that border, and comes into the world of humans where it doesn't belong, and then goes back. So those borders between civilization and wilderness, between the village and the forest, they're not strong borders. They're not strict borders. There's a permeability to them. And just as an idea, think about how does that idea of crossing over borders or the bear that comes from the forest to the village or the graveyard out of the wilderness into the human world, how does that echo or relate to or resonate with or or further develop the idea that we talked about a few slides ago about the werewolf which is human and animal in one being these two things that shouldn't be together but are new sentence at midnight especially on Valpurgisnacht now, I'll leave it to you to Google Walpurgisnacht and find out what it means. It is important, and it'll actually tell you a lot if you look up what Walpurgisnacht means, but I'll let you do that. But even not knowing what that means, you can get quite a bit out of this little phrase. And the question is, what is important about the setting? That is, most specifically, what's important about the time? What happens at midnight? What symbolically does midnight represent? What do we associate with midnight? Well, it's the middle of the night. Ostensibly, I don't think literally, but uh, uh, you know, the darkest point of night. What do we often call it? What's the sort of nickname or slang term for midnight? The witching hour. So what happens at midnight? Well, this is when bad things happen things that you can't do in the daylight, things that need the cover of darkness occur at midnight. And as we see in the next sentence or next part of the sentence, that's exactly what happens. The devil holds picnics in the graveyards and invites the witches. So at midnight, that's when the devil and his witches come out and have their fun. And as I said, what, are, what words are the most surprising in this phrase? What word stands out as out of place? To me, it's picnic. What do we normally associate picnics with? Well, a picnic is something fun. It's something pleasant. It's something relaxing, maybe even something romantic. You go out on a nice spring day and you spread out your blanket and you have some food with your friends or loved ones. A picnic is something enjoyable. It's not something that you do at midnight in a graveyard. right? So this is kind of a perverted picnic, a demonic picnic, a satanic picnic, because it's the exact opposite of what we normally want. It's in a horrible place, and it has horrible people there. And as the sentence ends, we see just how perverted this picnic is. Then they dig up fresh corpses and eat them. So the sort of horror of this world, the danger of the world, the fact that these monstrous things are occurring around them and they have no real way to stop them. How do you stop the devil and witches from having their satanic picnics at night? Well, you don't. You can't. Right? You just stay away you lock your doors and you don't go out after midnight. And again, that you know, they're eating corpses, not champagne and strawberries. Um, going back to the idea of the values of these people, the characters in the story, how might they be affected by this idea that the devil and his witch friends are eating the fresh corpses of their loved ones. Well, that's pretty horrific. 
that's something that would be terrifying and very, very upsetting for people who value and respect their dead. So this once more reinforces that idea that there's a certain harshness and bleakness, and again, that this is a supernatural and dark world that these people live in. And finally, the last sentence of this passage, anyone will tell you that. What's the narrator's tone here? That is, what's the tone of voice? How do you imagine them saying this? It's an interesting statement because sometimes when you say anyone will tell you that, what you mean is, well, everybody knows that, right? Everyone knows this. Anyone can tell you that. It's such a commonly known truth. So all these people in this northern country, any one of them will tell you, yeah, don't go to the graveyard at midnight. The devil's going to be there with the witches having a, a demonic picnic. So the narrator might be giving a sort of matter of fact. This is a, just a known fact. This is a truth that we all accept. But also, could the narrator be ironic or almost a little sarcastic? Like, oh, anyone will tell you that. Almost mocking these characters for their superstitious beliefs. Because again, do we see this happening in our world? Do we see the devil having picnics in the graveyard with witches and eating corpses? Probably not. Not something that we see. So is there maybe a bit of tongue-in-cheek to what the narrator is saying here? I don't know. That's an area that's open to interpretation. It's something that, as you read the rest of the story, to consider. Are there any moments when the narrator seems to be mocking the characters? Are we meant to take this seriously? Are we meant to believe what we're reading? Or does the narrator want us to be skeptical about it? It's a difficult question. I don't know if there's an exact answer to it, but it's one to consider. So just a few final tips about close reading. Again, focus on detail. Close reading is all about detail. This is not where you paraphrase or where you say, well, it seems like this might be the kind of impression. You want to look for specific things. Right? Focus on the detail. What words are actually being used? How exactly are they being used? What order are they being used in? And so forth. You want to proceed very slowly and deliberately, like we've been doing here. Sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, word by word. And go very carefully through what you're reading. Be curious. Ask questions. If you see, and, and this connects to the next one, if you see a word that you don't know, like Valpurgis knocked, ask yourself, what does that word mean? And look it up. Ask questions about why is it being described in this way? Why are the graveyards described as bleak and touching townships of the dead? That's very unusual. So what might that mean? And so look up those words that are unusual, significant, strange. Of course, look up words that you don't know, but also look up words that you do know, that you think might be being used in an unusual way because you'll find out that many words have multiple meanings. So make sure you look up those unusual and significant uh, uh, and, and prominent words and consider the multiple meanings that might be suggested by those words. Make connections to other texts and ideas. I've been doing a little bit of that as we've been going through, right? Well, the idea of them leaving these cakes and, and, and pictures and so forth for their um, deceased relatives and friends reminded me of other sorts of cultural activities that, that I know about or that I'm familiar with, ancestor worship and, and uh, the process of you know, making uh, shrines for the recently deceased and leaving goods as a way to kind of show your concern for them and your love for those people that you've lost. Make connections to things that you might have read, um, uh, other stories that might be similar. 
And then again, think finally, think expansively and not reductively. You're not trying to decode the text. There's not a secret code that you can where you can replace the leg of a pig with some other word or some other idea. It's not about translating. Again, it's about unpacking and unfolding. So think about trying to show not just replace one word with another, but to show all the different meanings that are there at once. So again, if we unfold a piece of paper, we can see all sides of that paper. If we unpack a suitcase, we can see all the different things that are in the suitcase. So when you're close reading, you're trying to show as many different meanings as possible. Ultimately, you want to decide on which ones you think are most important, which ones you think are most significant. Uh, but at least at this first stage, think in terms of multiplicity and complexity. So now using this, looking at the sample analysis on the blogs page, you hopefully will be able to go on and work on your own analysis. Follow the format that I've used here um, and the format that I've used in the sample analysis. So you type out the, the passage that you're going to analyze and then type out in little sections, okay, this sentence and here's my ideas about it. This sentence, here's my ideas about it. Here's a phrase, this is what I think about that phrase. And so just go through and really show me how you're proceeding through the text to come up with your ideas. If you have any questions, you know how to get in touch with me, uh, and I look forward to reading your work at the end of this week.